Hi everyone, my name is Gabriel and this is the Hour of the Raven, your channel for everything Ravenloft, RPG, Dungeons and Dragons and Horror. Still on a brief pause in our travels to the lands of the mists, today we will address some ideas on how to try to connect the material of the new book Von Richten Guide to Ravenloft and the lore of the classic setting. If you already have the new book, or if you watched my review, you might know that Von Richten Guide to Ravenloft is a complete reboot of the setting, disregarding the content of the old editions and introducing a new version of Ravenloft. The classic and modern version of the setting are incompatible and contradict each other, and narrators and players will have to choose whether they prefer to play in the classic Ravenloft or in the setting rewritten for the 5th edition. The purpose of this video is not to dive into any official content, and I intend only to present some ideas that I had on how to mix these settings, pinning elements that are more interesting for your narrative, or trying to create a bridge to connect both settings. Are you ready? So let's enter this brainstorm and try to find a road to navigate the unstable mists of the demiplane of dread. Of Ravenloft's new demiplane of dread is a nightmare reality. Many of the dark lords and domains undergo major changes, and the setting doesn't have a core, with all domains surrounded by mists, like islands. There is a break in continuity with the old setting and none of the plots under development by the authors are used in the new setting of the 5th edition. The first mental exercise we will be doing will be the attempt to create a bridge between the classic Ravenloft and this new nightmare reality proposed by the Van Richten Guide to Ravenloft. These ideas can be especially interesting for those who intend to narrate in the new setting, presented in the 5th edition, but still have the classic material as a basis for past events. What could have destroyed the core and changed the reality of the old version of the Demiplane of Dread so drastically? The first idea to try to justify these changes will be the arrival of the time of unparalleled darkness, predicted in the prophecies of Theodorus' reigns, the bastion of the Church of Ezra, of the sect of Nevuchar Springs in Darkon. In his apocalyptic visions, Theodore's reigns foresaw the coming of a great cataclysm. Although the contents of Theodore Reigns' visions have never been officially revealed, it is possible to imagine, from the direction that the metaplot of the setting was heading in the third edition, that these events would involve big characters of the setting, such as Ezelin and the Gentleman Caller, and his accursed offspring. Could this great event destroy the core and the lands of the mist as we know it? What would be the signs of the prophecy that would foreshadow such a cataclysm, and what would have been the consequence of these events? The time of unparalleled darkness, like the Grand Conjunction, could have destroyed the demiplane, ending the classic setting, and moving it into the direction of the new proposal. Could adventurers have prevented the fulfillment of the last signs of the prophecy, avoiding the destruction of the demiplane of dread? and the liberation of the evils contained in some of its domains. In addition to the time of unparalleled darkness, other events and creatures could be responsible for destroying the core and the transforming of the demiplane of dread into a nightmare reality. Azalin Rex has always been involved in many attempts to escape his misty prison, and his plans have always had catastrophic consequences. During the Grand Conjunction, he directly interfered in the sequence of the signs of the prophecy, preventing its completely fulfillment. This interference ended up saving the Demiplane of Dread from being undone, releasing its prisoners to the rest of the universe. Considering that the new book indicates that Azalin is missing from his domain, with Darkon being slowly devoured by the mists, perhaps the Lich King is the cause of this devastation to the core. An interesting plot to connect both settings could be to develop what Azalin did this time, and how successful his plan was. 
did Azalin again interfere with time travel spells to wreak even more havoc to the Demiplane of Dread? The destruction of the Demiplane of Dread could also directly involve the gentleman Kala and his cursed offspring. This plot, which had first appeared in the second edition, was being actively developed by White Wolf in its supplements before the setting was cancelled. What could be the Kalar's sinister purpose and the role of his demonic offspring in the future of the Lands of the Mists? Would his son, Malokyo Adere, the Dark Messiah known as the Dukar, be able to destroy the entire Vistani people? What could be the consequence of this genocide? Did the Vistani play any role as guardians of the Demiplane of Dread? Perhaps a more ancient prophecy could still be fulfilled to destroy the Demiplane of Dread. The Grand Conjunction, a cataclysmic event from Ravenloft's past, was only averted because one of its signs was avoided. This prophecy sign told that the Arcanal of Inahira would reverse its destiny, condemning all who lived to a terrible curse. What would happen if this macabre sign happened late and the Arcanal of Inahira could finally obtain Strahd's soul as payment for his debt? Perhaps the Grand Conjunction would finally occur and destroy the Demiplane of Dread. Another dangerous Dark Lord who could be responsible for the destruction and alteration of reality in the Demiplane of Dread could be Vecna, the God of Secrets. Vecna was a prisoner of the Mists in the past, but escaped his domain in the events described in the adventure Die, Vecna, Die. Vecna absorbed the demigod use from the Greyhawk setting and then went to invade Sigil where he intended to reshape the multiverse to his will. This epic event is used as a justification for changes in the system between the second and third edition of Dungeons and Dragons. Vecna is referred a lot in the modules of the fifth edition and his influence can be seen in small references through almost all official adventures. Perhaps Vecna's departure has destabilized the mists, or maybe he has glimpsed in Sigil the truth about the Dark Powers, and somehow tried to destroy the Demiplane of Dread to achieve his nefarious goals. Another cosmic entity capable of wreaking such havoc in the Demiplane of Dread is Gwydion, the Sorcerer Fiend. This cosmic entity is the Dark Lord of the Shadow Rift, and is trapped in a dimensional portal, unable to cross completely to the Demiplane of Dread. Perhaps the followers of this entity have finally found a way to release this ancient horror. Who knows what the cosmic darkness of this entity from the Plane of Shadows could cause to the Demiplane of Dread or to the other domains that existed in the core. Finally, the nightmare reality described for the new setting may indicate the involvement of the Dark Lords known as the Nightmare Court. This mysterious entity governs a domain of dreams and nightmares, and in any part of the Demiplane, it is possible to access or be engulfed into this reality through dreams. Could this Nightmare Court be behind this nightmarish and unusual reality that seems to represent the new version of Raveloft for 5th edition? Perhaps they have managed to escape their dream domain, expanding their influence and undermining the basis of reality to swallow the domains in an eternal nightmare. Perhaps the entire setting presented in Van Richten Guide to Ravenloft is just a great nightmare that takes place inside the nightmare lands, while the true demiplane of dread still exists somewhere lost in the mists. These sinister possibilities can be used to connect the classic setting to the 5th edition version, creating a bridge for narrators to explore these apocalyptic events or to take advantage of the lore from books of past editions to enhance their adventures in the present version of the Lands of the Mists. Although the inconsistencies of the older and new versions of the setting may not be easily explained, they can be the result of time travel, alternative dimensions, 
cosmic horrors that defy understanding, or even the invasion of a nightmare reality. I have a Ravenloft campaign that started 16 years ago, and today the Demiplane of Dread has been destroyed, following the fulfillment of a series of prophecies that predicted the time of unparalleled darkness. I used several of the above ideas as signs of the forthcoming destruction of the Demiplane of Dread. Now, my players are on a cosmic horror campaign to prevent an ancient horror that was held captive by the mists of the Demiplane of Dread from awakening and annihilating the entire universe. These were ideas to help those who intend to play in the current setting of Ravenloft, to connect it to the classic setting, bringing an idea of evolution to the plot. However, it is also possible to take the opposite path, for those who intend to play in the classic setting, that wish to incorporate elements of the current setting in their campaigns. One of the first challenges to be considered for those who want to play in the classic setting with elements presented in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft is to think how elements of high fantasy and fantastic races can be incorporated into the low magic setting of the classic Ravenloft. The previous version of the setting was mostly composed of humans, and non-human races suffered from prejudice and xenophobia, being the target of superstition and distrust. In addition, magic was seen as dangerous and evil in most of the core lands. However, there has always been the possibility that the mist will bring individuals of any race into their midst, however as exotic they may be. Perhaps, in more recent years of the timeline of the classic setting, an increasing number of exotic races has been swallowed up by the mists, and a great influx of these humanoids have arrived in the cities of the lands of the mists. It would be interesting to develop how the communities in these realms have dealt with this great influx of tieflings, azimars, half-orcs, tabaxis, dragonborns and others. Would these races be accepted over time? Would they set up their own isolated communities? Would they be persecuted or targeted by an inquisition to purge their evil influence? A wide range of horror stories can be developed through these premises. The arrival of these different races and a higher level of magic can also be the result of contact with a new domain. Imagine the unveiling through the mists of a new realm connected to the core and the first contact between its inhabitants with the other realms of the mists. Would these more exotic races leave these lands to explore the core? Are they refugees from their homelands? If the theme of racial conflicts and contact resulting from these interactions is not the focus of your campaign, it would be enough to spend the passage of time. Perhaps this contact and arrival took place many years ago in your campaign, and now the communities are no longer surprised by the presence of these races and the use of magic in their mists. As for the new versions of domains and their new Dark Lords, adapting the current setting to the classic Ravenloft becomes more difficult but not impossible. The geography of these domains is no longer the same, so if you intend to keep the classic Ravenloft, I suggest keeping the old description of these domains picking from the new book only items you understand relevant to add to your narrative. I will address the domains that are present in detail in the book, presenting some ideas on how to merge some of the new concepts presented with the domains of the classical Ravenloft. In many cases, the best alternative I found was simply to transform the new version of the Dark Lords into other characters, who can be antagonists or allies of the classic Dark Lords of the settings. Barovia is one of the domains that have the least new features in the book, considering what had already been published in Curse of Strad. The main novelty presented is the elements of the cultist of Ozibus and the Umist Inquisitors. Honestly, I preferred the Dark Powers as something more mysterious and uncertain, and I will not integrate the cultist of Ozibus or Umist Inquisitors into my campaign. If you want to integrate this strange cultist into Barovia, I would create an esoteric order that studied the nature of the Demiplane of Dread. 
and who believe that Strahd is the primordial evil, the link that maintains this prison of mists. Another option would be to place these cultists under the leadership of the Arcanoloth in Ahira, as a force to oppose Strahd in his own lands. The Bloodspore domain presents some changes in the lore of the classic setting, but these changes are easily adaptable for those who wish to use the new version in their campaigns. The Godbrain was one of the least developed Dark Lords in terms of background, and the version presented in the new book can simply be transported to the classic version. The only point to adapt is that in the past, the vampire elites had been created by rebellious mind flayers, and in the new version, they are in the service of the god brain, while the rebels have settled in another location in the domain. To adjust these changes, it's enough to say that after the events of the adventure Tofts of Darkness, the god brain took control of the vampiric elites, and the surviving rebels had to hide their presence in another lair. Boca, in the 5th edition, is still a setting of political intrigues and murders, but it seems to me strange how this would work in such a closed environment, and without political intrigues and trade with other domains. In Ivana's new story, she stops being a black widow, a seducer who manipulates everyone her beauty and murder her suitors, and becomes a woman who came to power through the murder of her relatives to manage her family's business empire. The Borizzi family now owns a company that manufactures perfumes and medicinal herbs, and after murdering her family to become the heir to the business, she hides the evidence that her father deemed her unfit and will transfer control of the company to her cousin Ivan Dislisnia. I believe that this new version of Ivana can be used in the classic setting not to replace the previous version of the Dark Lord, but as a noble and aristocrat from another Borkan family, perhaps even one of the Emordenums in Ivana's service. The new Ivan is extremely old and has undergone slight changes in his personality. Pampered and childlike, he keeps his mansion full of macabre toys, manipulating many to come and keep him company at the gravel mansion to play his sick games and intrigues. He is now a recluse in his mansion, filled with ghoulish toys. Although Ivan's old age and reclusive personality is difficult to fit with the previous version of a nobleman who controlled militias and spies in foreign lands, they maintained his spoiled and extravagant personality. I would include in Ivan from the classic setting this bizarre interest in toys and props, which can make the Degravo Mansion even more disturbing for its visitors. The Carnival is altered to become a domain, with the Dark Lord as the sword Nefente, carried by Isolde, a Eladrin. In addition to the alteration of Isolde's past, the rest of Carnival seems to be a summarized version of the previous Carnival supplement and it's poor in the tale. I would not incorporate the changes of the new book to the carnival, keeping the material as already described in the previous box, as they are richer and more integrated with the classic setting. The new Dark Lord, Nefente, seems to me somewhat similar to Ebon Bane in the classic setting. However, if you intend to transform carnival into a domain, the inclusion of the Cursed Sword as Dark Lord in his old hand can be easily arranged, without altering the other elements of the classic carnival. Darkon underwent considerable changes, erasing the events of the Green Harvest and the existence of Necropolis. Despite this, the description of the domain is remarkably similar to what we see in the box Requiem the Green Harvest which describe the possible candidates for the post of Dark Lord in those lands. If you are thinking of narrating in the classic setting during Azalin's absence from Dark Lord, the idea of the mists encroaching on the domain might be an interesting topic to incorporate. Of the possible candidates for the post of Dark Lord, an interesting character that I would certainly incorporate into Dark Lord plot would be Madame Talisveri Eris a permanently invisible woman, 
who only appears when she covers her body with makeup and clothes. Alcio Metos, the sister of Baron Metos, dominates Martira Bay, but is extremely similar to the character Tavelia of the classic Ravenloft, as a local crime leader. The plot involving Dakalos Rex and the Eternal Order, on the other hand, cannot be easily related to the classic Darkon since it distorts the Eternal Order, the main religion of Darkon. The Molyu is a domain that has undergone major changes and features an entirely new Dark Lord. It is an interesting addition, although the proposal works better as an isolated adventure than a broader setting. I love the concept of Sadira Donea, a mix of macabre Cinderella and a plague rate but I wouldn't replace it with Dementia's already established dominion and his dark lord, Dominic Donaire. Sadira and her macabre gala could easily be portrayed as a demi-lord from some other city in the domain, such as a noble woman from Shadow Fox, for example. In this way, it is perfectly possible to use the interesting concepts of the new book without necessarily undoing the intrigues and plots of Demoli classic setting. The new Falkovnia features a female version of Vlad Drakov. The general ceases to be a conqueror who threatens other kingdoms and becomes a military leader who leads her men to survive the constant and cyclical invasion of the undead. With the proposal to maintain the classic setting and integrate the elements proposed in the new book, I would keep the original Vlad Drakov in power. The proposal for a constant zombie invasion in those lands can be incorporated in several different ways. All of Drakov's previous invasions to Darkon has always ended with the uprising of the dead to prevent his army advances. Perhaps Azalin has grown tired of Drakov's futile attempts and cast powerful spells on Falkovnia to raise the dead, or perhaps Drakov has committed even more dark acts to deserve an even worse curse and punishment from the dark powers. It would be curious to see the old hawk constantly having to fight to defend his own lands from the undead hordes, which bear the face of fallen allies and victims of his cruelties. For those who intend to incorporate Vladeska Drakov into the classic setting, the supreme leader of Falkovnia has a history of having many bastard children, and perhaps she can be a doctor who has won his trust and appreciation, inheriting the position of her father as a military leader. Perhaps the old Drakov is still alive inside his fortress, and must watch the ruin of his kingdom, while Vladeska tries to save what remains of his realm. Harakia also undergoes a drastic change and it becomes a high fantasy domain, more active and less desolate than the previous version. Harakia is a domain that has seen little development since the Touch of Death adventure, and I believe that several elements of this domain can be incorporated into the classic setting. The events of the Touch of Death adventure take place before the Grand Conjunction, more than 20 years from the last date on which the setting ended its timeline. The adventure ends with the new awakening of Ankepoth after Semet's betrayal. In my campaign, when my players returned to Harakir, I made them find a completely transformed domain, with Pharaoh Ankepoth leading a new empire, with major construction projects, and waging a war against Farazia's domain. Thus, this new version of Harakir, with countless temples and cities, Rolled by mummies can be incorporated into the classic version as a development of the classic Harakir after the return of his pharaoh. Aslan's new domain is the setting for an arcane apocalypse where countless magical experiments have brought destruction and chaos. This tragic and destructive scenario may perhaps be incorporated as the consequences of the ritual that Hazlik of the classic Ravenloft intended to conduct, to destroy the entire Mulan people. Incorporating these elements can be an interesting way to change the domain of Hazlan. What could have happened if Hazlik's gigantic ritual had failed? 
Would this ritual be able to destroy the lands of Hazilan, or destabilize the magic in those lands? What could become of the wizards who study under Hazilic's tutelage? If I were to use any of these elements of the new version of Hazlan, I would cause the ritual to fail catastrophically, causing such destructive events. Hazlan could now be under the influence of Elani of Toyalis, leaving open to the narrator to determine if Hazlik managed to transfer his soul to Elani's body or not. The iCat domain was an excellent surprise for me. The original domain consisted only of a palace surrounded by a forest, inhabited only by the Dark Lord and her doctors. Honestly, the classic setting of iCat was very difficult to use in a more complex adventure, and I would totally replace the classic version with the new version featured in the Van Richten Guide to Ravenloft. Kalakeri attests that one of his old names was Zri Haji but presents a new version of the domain and a new Dark Lord, although a modified version of Arijani is also presented. Although these stories are at first incompatible, it is possible to integrate part of the elements of Kalakeri into Sri Haji classic version. Kalakeri has a team of dark fantasy and has a cruel and long war between siblings for power in the region. The Dark Lord of the domain is Ramya, a Death Knight, who is the legitimate ruler of those lands, but was betrayed by her brothers and now rules cruelly, seeing betrayals in everyone around her. In the history of the classic Sri Haji, Arijani is a Hakshaza, son of the god Havana with a mortal woman. To bring these new characters to the classic Sri Haji, Ramya and Heva, his sisters, may be other doctors of the same deity. Perhaps, Arijanali was finally challenged in his power at Sri Haji, and his sister Ramya rose from her grave to confront the then absolute lord of this domain. In Kartakas, the domain and its dark lord Harkon Lucas takes a more modern approach. Harkon Lucas is now constantly seeking fame and recognition and has turned it into a loop garu. Analyzing the new image of Harkon Lucas, with his red fiddle, the theme of the devil and the fiddle came to mind, and the myth of blues musician that made a pact with the devil at a crossroad to gain supernatural music talent. If I were to take advantage of this concept, I would incorporate this new version of Harkon Lucas as a new character, someone who could shake up the dynamics of Kartakas and represent an antagonist for the classic Harkon Lucas. Imagine what would have happened if a strange bar from distant lands unexpectedly arrived in Skald and participated in the Meister Singer contest, defeating Harkon Lucas with his music and skills from a diabolic pact. This could be the basis of an interesting conflict between werewolves and wolfwares, led by two cruel monstrous bards. In Lamordia, I believe that it is possible to merge the history of both the classic and new Dark Lords, with some changes to the history. In the classic setting, Victor Monehain performed unethical scientific experiments, but was unable to recover the health of his wife Elise, who was kept alive with the aid of mechanical devices. Adam, his creature, roamed the desolate freezing areas of the domain and was the declared enemy of his creator, interfering with his scientific projects. In the past, Mordenheim had already enlisted the help of necromancers to help restore his wife Elise. To integrate the new characters presented in the new book, I would add Victor and Elise to Victor Mordenheim's pre-existing story. Here is my take on how to do it. Victor could be a scientist who excelled in her research, expanding the studies initiated by Victor. Victor had a mistress, who we shall call Alice, just not to be confused with more than high wife, also named Elise. Alice helped Victor by stealing newly buried bodies from cemeteries, but their criminal scheme was discovered, and both had to flee in order not to be arrested. 
Victor's work caught Victor's attention, and the old scientist asked her to help him with a project to restore his wife Elise back to life. Victor and Alice moved to Slosh Mordenheim, and they began to work together on this project. Victor was responsible for seeing a new body to house his wife's brain, while Victor was to develop the unbreakable heart, a mechanical marvel that would keep their creation alive. Alice asked Victor to abandon her new obsession and escape with her from these lands, revealing that she had a serious terminal illness. Shaken by this news, Victor was considering leaving the experiment. Victor overhears this conversation in secret and decides to interfere. That night, Victor murders Alice with a little injection. Victor finds her body, and in despair, Mordehyde testified that her heart had failed due to a rare disease. Victor became obsessed with bringing her lover back to life and will need the help of Mordenheim's knowledge of raising flesh golems. She suggests to Mordenheim to use Alice's body for the experiment. In secret, Victor preserves Alice's brain and plans to use her brain in the body resuscitation process, replacing the brain of Mordenheim's wife, Elise. After completing the creation of the Unbreakable Heart and sealing Alice's body, the two scientists were ready to do the brain transfer. There is a short window of time to transfer Elise's living brain into the body, and Victor has Alice's preserved brain in a jar next to her. When the moment of the transfer arrives, Victor's intentions are revealed, and she and Victor Monerheim enter into a conflict. The dispute between the two scientists is interrupted by the arrival of Adam, the creature of modern high. Obstinate to thwart his creator plans, he attacks and begins to destroy the laboratory. In the chaos that ensues, both distracted brains are thrown to the ground, and it is impossible to know who each brain belongs to. While Mordenheim tries to get Adam out of his laboratory, Victor shoots one of the brains that has fallen to the floor and completes the procedure to revive the body. The experiment is successful, and the body rises. In the chaos that ensues, Victor is knocked unconscious after taking a blow from Adam. When she awakens, both creatures have disappeared, and she is with Victor Mordenheim in his ruined laboratory. This is my idea on how to try to merge both characters from the classic and the new domain of Lamoria. The creature Elise now wanders without memories, with the vindictive Adam as her mentor. Is she more than High's wife in the resurrected corpse, or could Victor have managed to bring back her beloved Alice? Both scientists would now be looking for Elise believing that she could be their companion, while Adam would take advantage of Elise's confusion to take revenge on his creator. Modern is a domain that has undergone little change and remains a haunted land. The main change that took place in Modern was the exclusion of its previous connection to Strahd's past in the creation of the apparatus. To use elements of Modern as proposed in the new book, just keep the original story of Strad and Ezalyn's visit to the domain, with no impediments for Lord Gorfrey to continue enslaving spirits or using the apparatus for other purposes. The new Rishmula brings an interesting proposal of the use of a plague as a tool of domination and control by Jacqueline Renier. Like Falconia, the plague has a cyclical nature, being used for Jacqueline to reinforce her position of power whenever it is threatened. Although the plague lose some of its efficiency without the isolation imposed by the new version of the domain, the incorporation of these elements in the classic scenario can be used as the adverse result of Jacqueline's experiments to infect ordinary rats as transmitters of lycanthropy. Furthermore, 
there is nothing to prevent the plague of this domain from spreading beyond the borders of Richemulor, and even beyond the control of Jacqueline Renier. Tepest has an interesting proposal in the new book, bringing a village that adores one of the hag as its provider. The proposal works well and is not incompatible with the old proposal of the classic domain, where a population frightened by the presence of fairy creatures led an inquisition to a witch hunt. I would adapt the village of the new Tepest as a remote location in the classic domain, but the old ways are still in force, resisting the influence of the inquisition and religion of Belenus. The entity known as Mother, who is adored by the village, could be treated as one of the three original hags that rebelled, or even as some other fairy creature that emerged from the Shadow Rift as an obscure opposing force. Valakan is one of the easiest domains to adapt elements of the new setting in terms of continuity with the classic setting, since it takes into account the existence of the former Dark Lord, Von Karkov. Chakuna is placed as a successor to Von Karkov, and if one intends to maintain the old setting of Valakan, it's possible to update the story of the fall of Kharkov and the rise of Shakuna. I would use Shakuna not as an already established successor to Kharkov, but as a challenger to his position. Perhaps she lost a sister or relative to the annual Kharkov lottery to select a wife, and performed profane rituals to become the relentless hunter who roams the jungle of Valakan, attacking and destroying the black leopards and others she believes are in service or enslaved by the vampire baron. This long video is the result of a brainstorm to try to reconcile the new setting with the classic Ravenloft. So what do you think of my ideas? Would they work in your table? What version do you intend to use in your campaign? What ideas do you have to try to merge or pick the best of each version of Ravenloft? Tell me in the comments. Also, don't forget to join us, subscribe and activate notifications and let's keep our exploration of the lands of the mists.